this is a big reason why I also talk about the business side of being an influencer, the business side of the influencer industry. If you are an influencer who produces content for brands, it's not just about the one Instagram photo. From just that little clip you heard from Emma, who is a Seattle content creator and her blog and Instagram Emma's edition aims to inspire the modern woman to create, travel and live life with style. As a fashion and lifestyle blogger, Emma shares everything from fashion trends to content creation tips. She loves sharing posing ideas, Instagrammable places, as well as her journey as a content creator. In fact, for the Instagrammable places, that's actually how I originally found her because she did a really cool guide for Pittsburgh. Emma is also a co-host for the Content Creatives Podcast with her friend. Together, they share how aspiring influencers and small businesses can discover, grow, and own their own brand. Emma was born in Los Angeles, lived briefly in the Philippines as a child, and primarily grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Prior to taking her creative career full-time, Emma worked in the aerospace industry. Yep, planes, people. For six years, she did this, and worked in the consumer packaged goods industry for a year after undergrad as well. We talk about that and the physical labor it took to set up Gatorade stands. I'm not even kidding. What you'll notice about Emma is her sweet nature, but even more so her passion for spreading the facts when it comes to the influencer industry. We've been following one another since 2018, and let me tell you, she is worth the follow. I've learned so much from her. So with that, let's welcome Emma. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much for having me on. Glad we are online now and we're able to chat today. Yes, we are. So you have your own podcast. I do. It's called the Content Creatives Podcast. I am a podcast co-host and my friend Maddie and I, who's also a Seattle blogger and content creator, actually teamed up together February of 2020 to launch the podcast. I love the name of it. It's so catchy and cute. Oh, thank you. Uh, When we were going back and forth, I think one thing I had, I was very intentional on when we were talking about like, what could we launch a podcast about? I knew, you know, with podcasts, with anything, right, you kind of want to have a specific point of view, right? And then you can start to broaden out and diversify with anything. And I knew, just from my experiences, creating, you know, sharing content creation tips, and lessons I've learned being an influencer, I knew that having a podcast around that would be really helpful. And so we played around with lots of names and topics. A lot were already taken. Um, I had that same situation. Yeah. You know, it's like, you kind of have to play around. You need to see if the URL is available, right? Like if you're going to have a website, you need to see if the handle's available on Instagram or on Twitter. And so we kind of played around with that. And we were like content creator. And I think that was already taken. So we're like content creatives. And it, within the name, you know that, you know, we're talking about content specifically, you know, being creative. And so the name kind of alludes to, you know, what the podcast is all about. Yeah, it really sets you apart. And I think that's something so special about your personal brand. I don't even have to see your Instagram handle. If I just see the quality and the colors of the image, I'm like, oh, that's Emma. I just know right away. That's so sweet. Thank you. (laughs) Your stuff is amazing. I remember you first did something with close friends where you're like, if you want to get my tips, you know, actually let's backtrack. Do you remember how our relationships are first started. I checked this morning. I was like, shit, like, how are we, what, what was the connect? I was flying to Pittsburgh and I DM'd you in the morning and I was, this is 2018. So I've been following for at least three, four years. And I was like, Hey, Emma flying to Pittsburgh in an hour. Can you share with me like three or four recommendations. I see you were recently there because you posted some photo. I don't even know where, but it was just something like that was beautiful in Pittsburgh. And yeah, I gave you a time limit. I'm like in an hour. And you were like, yeah, actually you responded within minutes. And like, that was super dick of me because I gave you no time, but you responded so quickly. And I was like, wow, like she was so nice. And then like from there on, I just was following and interacting and just seeing how you were constantly changing you not even changing, you were just doing things so differently than anyone else who I was following. And it was so incredible to see. My gosh, that's like so sweet. I'm glad I was able to help you. Honestly, the timing was perfect. The reason why I went to Pittsburgh, I wrote this whole blog post, Pittsburgh's most Instagrammable places. And I had actually pitched Alaska Airlines. Alaska Airlines is also headquartered in Seattle. 
and I pitched them for a partnership. And I literally was like, let's go to Palm Springs. Let's go to LA. And they were like, we want you to go to Pittsburgh. And so I was like, okay, let's go to Pittsburgh. And that's amazing. It was just so funny. So um, I actually did have a great time in Pittsburgh. I feel like, you know, when people think to like vacation, they probably don't think of Pittsburgh right away. Yeah, definitely but not. When we went there, I was like, oh my God, there's great spots to eat. The city is really easy to get around. It's not super crowded. I mean, granted, we did go in winter, but yeah, we had a great time. And one thing I just also wanted to say thank you to about just like doing things differently. I think one thing I have really, I've really tried to do within content creation in my creative career is when everyone is zigging, I'm trying to zag. I'm trying to do the opposite. I love that. I'm, I'm trying to just do things differently and like test different things like I always hear but there's already like so many influencers out there there's so many so many influencers who do fashion there's so many influencers who do style it's like but you can still do these things if you lean in to like kind of what makes you unique and you experiment with different things that help build community and so yes you called out close friends that was something I tested and and I'm, gl- and I'm glad I did because I was like looking for different ways to to build community. I kind of have fallen off that. It was like a Instagram, you know, feature that they launched. And I'm sure people still use it and stuff. But that was just one of the things I had tested I get, in 2018. Yes. So tell me you have a creative career and you did. You left your aerospace, right? I did. So what's your story? Because someone listening is probably just like, who is this chick? Oh, yes, yes. We can probably like take it way back because I feel like back a lot of the has, beginning back to the beginning. Oh my gosh. Like the Hillary Duff song just like started playing in my head. <laughs> you know, I I'm love talking. her. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. I started and this edition as a blog and Instagram, my senior year of college back in 2014. So the reality was I was in recruiting season. So fall in the business school, my undergrad is in business with a focus in sales and marketing. And during the fall season, recruiters are on campus, college fairs are happening, you know, you're going through final round interviews. And at the time, when I was going through interviews, I knew I was going to either land in tech, aerospace, or the consumer packaged goods industry, very different from fashion. And, um, and I know, I don't want to like, say this to like, put the fashion industry down, because that's not at all what it was. But I honestly looked at starting salaries of like in fashion versus tech versus CPG versus aerospace. And it was like a 20 to $30,000 pay difference. Wow. And so it's very, I mean, I, I am sure you, if you um, have gotten a glimpse of my content, I, I will say like one thing that's unique about me is I really approach things, the really business mindset. Yes. And so I, I would definitely up- want to get to that. Yes. <laughs> So I looked at that and I said, okay, I'm not going to start my career in fashion. I have student loans. Like I want to get off a good start to my career, set myself up well financially. And so yeah, like financial um, freedom. Yes. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, like I'm going to find a way to incorporate fashion and style and being creative as a, and at the time I didn't even consider it as a side hustle as just a side thing just because I was seeing examples of real life women like Ami Song and Nani from Nani Closet. She's amazing. Amazing. Like Like goals. Honestly, like so many great women at that time and, you know, especially the OG bloggers, they were regular women, regular women posting outfits, building communities, like launching their own brands. And I was like, okay, like if, you know, these Asian American or these petite women or these women of color can like create their own platforms and like have a space to be creative. Like I can do that too. And so, you know, just a big call out to like why representation is so important. Just seeing an example gives you an idea that like, oh, this is possible for me too. And so decided to start my fashion and style blog and this edition because it was my take on fashion and style don't know where the name, I think it was just like popped into my head. So I was like, well, perfect. And um, I love just, a good alliteration. I tell everyone. Me too. This. Me too. Like alliterations make me like, ooh, yeah. And yes, content creatives, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's another one. Yeah, yeah. It's I perfect. I really like it. So I launched my blog 2014. But honestly, you guys, 2014, 2015, I had graduated. I was just like trying to survive in corporate America, like drowning, drowning my first corporate job. 
<laughs> like I'm sure many other people out there. Um, Were you working just like horrible hours and it was so draining? Yeah, I, um, so I did PepsiCo's sales rotational program. And in the first year they have you, it's a, your retail sales associate. So I had 31 grocery stores in Orange County that I would wow. service and like build Gatorade displays. And it was a very physical job. I went from airplanes to groceries. It was a different thing. And I was like, you know what? Like I, I actually really need to care about the products I'm selling And like the products I'm a part of. And like, for me, like, I can't sweat. And I, it's not little, I mean, obviously there's people who have built their careers selling Quaker Oats and Gatorade, right? Great brands. But like, I was like, I just can't like get stressed out about like oatmeal and like, (laughs) (laughs) so not, not to like put it down, but I'm, there's other people, you know, who, who are very passionate about it. And I was like, okay, you know, I enjoy all the food. I still consume a lot of the products, but I think I'm going to go back into aerospace. So it was only at PepsiCo for a year and then decided to move back to Seattle, work for the Boeing company because I had done two summer internships um, with Boeing. And Wait, then, are you originally or, from Seattle? I am. I did. I've grown up majority. Okay. I grew up in Seattle. We moved here when I was in time for kindergarten. So like five or six. And then you went yeah. to Orange County just for that job? Just for a year. Okay. So then back yes. to Seattle. And then back to Seattle. Yes. And then At this time, right, like the first two years, I was posting on Emma's Edition maybe once a month on my blog. And at this time, blog, you literally mean like the website. You're not talking about like up Instagram posts. Like this is like old. No one can see me. I'm using air quotes. This is old fashioned. (laughs) Literally posting. The blog. Yes, the blog. My Instagram was still a personal Instagram. I was shooting with photographers. I met a photographer in Orange County. It just, it was more casual though, you know, like my focus was like, trying to get stable in my career. And so when I decided to move back to Seattle, a big motivator was I wanted my master's program and Boeing paid for a hundred percent of my master's program. And so I was like, okay, wow. like I'm going to go back because I don't want to take on any more student debt. So like, let me go back, work for Boeing, get my master's degree, and then I'll figure it out from there. And so when I moved back to Seattle, I was in such a better place more stable in my career. I like had my plan. And then I started going to Seattle blogging events and like meeting other Seattle bloggers, which I didn't even know were like out there and like learning that people were making money, making careers out of it. And I was just like, wait, what? I was like, was it hush hush though? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 There's, there were workshops where it was like, you can make money, but it wasn't like, you can make X amount by doing uh, X, Y, and Z. Yes, exactly that. And mm-hmm. I was just like so confused because I was like, wait, h- how? Like, how you- <laughs> so um, 2016, um, I really say is when I started taking my blog and my Instagram much more seriously. I think being more stable in my career or, fe- you know, relatively and um, seeing other examples of other Seattle bloggers, like taking blogging more seriously. I was like, okay, I, I want to take this more seriously. I want to see what I can do with this while still balancing a full-time job. And so... I know it's kind of been a long story, but I pretty much decided in 2016 that I was going to learn everything I could about blogging, about Instagram, about building community and building your influence. And I just like went from there. And then I worked in aerospace from 2016 through 2020. Um, And so with my internships, I was there for a total of six years, 2020, the pandemic happened. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. And obviously I know it turned a lot of people's lives upside down. I totally, I'm very empathetic to that. And um, I was laid off after, just like right after I celebrated my sixth year anniversary with, with my company, I got my, got my layoff notice. So this time this year, it's kind of crazy that like we're chatting because now I can like look back after a year. I was a hot mess. I was crying oh. every week. I don't think, I mean, I didn't post or share that. I was crying every week, the month of July. Cause <sighs> I was like, what do I do? Like 60 days before I get laid off, do I stay? Do I go? Do I apply for new jobs? And I mean, I guess like, luckily, I guess in my perspective, I had taken the time to build up on this edition, right? Where I was confident in my ability to make money. I knew my brand, I knew my audience. And, um, I think it was kind of the universe being like, it's time it's to time. 
it's time to go. And so that's when I decided to take um, as an addition full time, but it was a full process in the summertime, just crying, reflecting, you know, sometimes you kind of just have to bet on yourself when the circumstances line up. So just, I need to start kind of talking about this more on Instagram and on my blog. So this time this year, I knew it was going to get laid off in 60 days. I had learned that I didn't need to pay back my master's program because the Boeing company that requires you to stay two years after they pay for your degree to prevent people from getting their, you know, and master's like program and then, running and then running out. So I only had been at the company or done my one year. And they literally, I, I called and I asked and I was like, but I still have a master's program. They're like, oh, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. I was like, you gave me a free master's program. And now you're telling me I can dip out of here. Like, what are you? T- okay. That's not a great business decision on your part, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> you didn't even maximize. The- okay. That's fine. Yeah. So it worked out in your favor though. It, it, it did. And my plan all along was to actually leave summer of 2021. So this, this would have been my plan to leave oh, anyways. Wow. And so um, it happened a year early, earlier than I had planned and anticipated, but it all ended up working out. So now doing content creation full time um, since September, again, of 2020. You touched on this in the beginning of the story, and I just want to emphasize the point. It was important for you to represent a minority so younger girls can maybe see you just like you saw others and feel like they have you know hope and that they can grow into something that they maybe at one point didn't think they could. How 100%. has race and diversity in general like, really affected you in this industry? Yeah, I'll actually bring it to a collaboration that happened in 2016, where just like my identity, my ethnicity, race and diversity, all of that kind of exploded. So 2016, 2000 followers on Instagram, again, just starting to make the decision to take things more seriously. And American Eagle Outfitters had tapped me for a style ambassadorship opportunity. And, you know, I, I think there was 10 of us nationwide, and I was the one in the Pacific Northwest. And I literally was like, what, me? I was like, why? Like, why would I? You're so <laughs> kind humble. Of the, the imposter syndrome kind of coming in. But um, oh gosh, we hate that. I, I really, I really questioned that because I mean, I loved American, I still do love American Eagle Outfitters. I worked there in high school, but like growing up, young Filipino, petite, tan women were not the face of American Eagle Outfitters. Yeah, they weren't not. the poster child. No, we're just, they're very diverse now. Like if you look at their website, mm-hmm. they've done a great job. Size inclusivity, you know, different races and ethnicities, ages. And no Photoshopping, like which I love. Yes, very too. yes. Yeah, and they, they've grown so much as a brand. And mm-hmm. so that whole year, they kept asking me on to come on each season. It was like, I started to shift who I could be versus like, oh, I've never been represented to, oh, wait, like, you see me as embodying, embodying your brand and your values where I can represent this brand from the in this region, like, that was like the biggest, like, mindset shift for me be like, oh, my gosh, just because this brand wasn't this way before, or, you know, again, like, a first generation Filipino American, brown, tan, petite, young women, we can do these things. And again, I'm so grateful the last five to six years, I think we have a long way to go, like, no doubt about that. But a lot and more brands have are trying to do the work to become more diverse and inclusive. It seems like, you know, even if it's just like one or two other young women of color or Filipino American women out there, that I can like help even in any way, shape or form, then I'm like really happy to be able to do that. And this is something I don't share a lot. It seems like it actually does work out that way. I usually talk to at least one or two college students (laughs) who are Filipino American, um, you know, young women trying to like navigate the next step of their careers, trying to figure out if like they should start creative path or, you know, work in corporate America. those are like conversations I, I do have um, just because I get it. I've, I've been there, you know, trying to like navigate what you do next. Has your family and recent husband been supportive all along or were they like, 
wait, wait, wait. Like you went to college, you got your master's, you are not going to post photos on Instagram because I've heard (laughs) from so many creators. It's like it's 50-50 depending on who you're talking to. Some people, their families are like, you go, girl. And others are like, no, 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 back to the books. And they have like really tough conversations. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you're asking this question because, I mean, it's just like we have to talk about this. One of the best pieces of advice I can share with any women out there is to just keep your friends and family in the loop. You don't, they don't have to necessarily agree with everything, but just like let them know what you're thinking, what the, what your potential plans are subject to change, but like, this is what you're feeling. So 2018, like winter of 2018, I had just finished my first quarter of grad school and I was like, oh my God, like I want to pursue digital media full time. I want to have a creative career. Like I'm loving, I only had done one quarter. I was like, I think I'm going to shift gears. I don't want to become an aerospace executive. Like I thought I wanted to be like, I want to do this. And so I sat my parents down (laughs) at their kitchen table. (laughs) I mean, you know, like I, you gave them the talk. I gave them the talk and I said, okay, I am going to leave Boeing someday. I was like, I'm shifting my career goals. I think I can do blogging full time. I think I could do Instagram full time. And I'm telling you now, my plan is I'm going to graduate in 2019. I have to stay an additional two years so I don't pay anything back. So by summer of 2021, I'm going to take this full time. And, you know, I have time to figure out how I'm going to save for retirement to build my emergency savings fund. I'm like such a planner. So I kind of, you know, I wanted to like ease their worries, especially like if you have immigrant parents, right. Who like come from a different country Mm -hmm. and like coming to the United States, like they risk it all. So they risk. Yeah. They're thinking now you're going to, they might not get it right away. Yes. Yeah. And you know, for them, like the dream was I go to college and I have a stable career. Like that was it. Right. Just stability was the, measure of success, right? Right. Like being able to have a 401k and full benefits. And so um, they actually took it better than I thought. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, what if they start yelling at me? I don't know. And you know, I think you kind of have to give your parents a little bit more credit. They also grow with you, right? I think there would have been a different reaction if I had brought that up when I was 18. But they, you know, they kind of took that step back. And they were like, okay, like, we understand you're feeling stressed out. And they kind of went through the journey too. They were like, what if you switched jobs? What if you switched teams? What if you like took a less stressful job? They actually saw me like within in 2019, after I had graduated, I switched jobs. And I would say like my last role in corporate America was probably the most challenging and like stressful job I had had to the point where I was in a really bad burnout cycle and my blood pressure was high like I had to go to the doctor and like it was very I mean again I was embarrassed so I like didn't talk about it but no it's real life (laughs) nothing to be embarrassed about it's I feel for you yeah and I now that I'm actually like talking to friends about it they're like stress is like a real thing and like Mm -hmm. you know like your body's affected and so my parents kind of saw that whole year where I really was struggling of trying to keep things together, trying to like maintain a positive attitude, but I was so stressed out at work. Like my body was like, we need a change. I think by the time I got my layoff notice, like it honestly, like my work situation, my work environment, I know this is not the case for a lot of people, but while I was still employed, actually improved when I started working from home because I was away from a micromanager, I was away from like a really toxic team environment. And so I was actually like, way better mental health wise, it could break my burnout cycle. But by the time my layoff notice came, my parents were were the ones they were like, you know, like, maybe it's time you take the blog full time and like, you just like see where it goes. And so, you know, I kind of gave them time to like, get there. (laughs) Like, I'm very grateful to my husband, my sister, my parents, they know how important like MS edition has been for me and how it's been a part of my life for so long and how I've continued to grow it and balance it with various life stages. And so everyone's been really supportive, especially when I was in grad school. It's one thing I kind of skimmed over, but when I was in grad school, I was working full-time 
grad school full time and I was still doing Emma's edition and it was insane for two years. But like, I was like, I'm, de- I'm very, I'm doing this. <laughs> so, um, but you know, everyone was understanding. I had limited time and you know, school's a lot. There's a lot about your profile, your content, your blog, your brand that I adore. One of them being that you're so direct, open, and honest about compensation and what to be actually asking for and what brands should expect in return. How do you feel confident in posting that, yet no one else does? So, okay, bringing it back, there's always a root on like why I do the things I do. In 2016, when I started asking the local Seattle blogging community how people were making money, my feedback was, you just throw a number out there and you see if it sticks. And I was like, what? I was very confused and frustrated because I was like, okay, I'm not asking you how much money you're making. I'm asking how is it possible to make money as a blogger and an influencer and a creator like that with my own personal kind of experiences and like really like life choices to make money, a more comfortable topic for women and women of color is like why I talk about money. And so in grad school, very first quarter, 2017, we needed to do um, a project about like a communication challenge or problem that's affecting society. And the one I picked was that women don't talk about money. As a society, there mm-hmm. are, with the exception, I know there's some families out there you know, who are open and and confident and, you know, raise daughters to be able to talk about money. But like, for a lot of women out there, the topic of money is still very taboo. There's shame around it. There's wariness about it. For me, as someone who kind of grew up in that scarcity, not just mindset, but we literally were just like paycheck to paycheck. I was like, I knew as an adult, I was like, I need to shift my relationship about money and how I shift my relationship about money is owning my narrative and how I tell my relationship about money. Because I can't live in scarcity. I'm not anymore. I have a stable job and I have a retirement plan and savings. I was like, that's not my reality anymore. So let's start to own our narrative, our story around money. And so why I just started talking about money on the blog, because one, my personal experiences, and you know, two, again, being told to throw a number out there. I just know that there are so many women creators and influencers and small business owners who struggle to talk about money today. Again, how we normalize it is we just start to have the conversation, right? If you whoever you are, whether you want a side hustle or you want to launch your own full-time business or you're trying to negotiate the next salary, your next salary promotion, right? How we do that is by getting comfortable around asking to be paid. How we do that is getting comfortable talking about money with our peers. So that's why I do that. I know that's scary to be like, I made X money this month. These are the brand partnerships I, I secured. This is how I do it. But at the same time, that's going to help someone in the future. I know hopefully five years from now, 10 years from now, that these money conversations hopefully going to feel a little bit easier. Has a brand ever said, please take that down or please don't share what the compensation is? No. So one of the things about navigating these money talks, I never like call out a brand and say, this brand agreed or or disagreed to pay me this. Part of that is, we can talk about money without needing to call anybody out, right? Like we can talk about like negotiation tactics on like what you can pull out to increase rates or, you know, in, with your personal, like I obviously have like a small group of like influencers where if I know a brand is lowballing you and like you're asking me, I will tell you like, hey, I would probably decline this partnership or I would continue to push the rate because I know that they have more budget for this content or this influencer activation, just from my personal experience. But no, I I haven't had any brands like that. Because again, I keep it professional. I might talk about an industry, I might talk about a time period, but I haven't, I would not call any brands out in that way. You say that you are a planner. I'm a planner. too. How do you Mm -hmm. strategize not only your content, but your methods, your pitches, pretty much like everything that encompasses the Emma edition brand? 
Yeah, I am a huge planner. And um, I think one thing I've learned is the busier you get, the better you have to be at planning or else like things kind of fall off, you know, Mm -hmm. the to do list and the priority list. So um, for me, I try to like segment my days out where I have like different objectives and priorities that like I'm working towards. So for example, Tuesdays and Wednesdays are my podcast days. Tuesdays, I publish the long podcast episode for the week. I send the email newsletter. I post on Facebook, our Facebook group, on Instagram. I also write the next two outlines that we're going to record that week. You know, this is like my podcast heavy days. Wednesdays, I'm recording the podcast. Um, Maddie and I actually record in person. We just come up with less audio issues. We're just like having all these audio issues. I was like, okay, let's record in person. Fridays, I actually start planning for the next week. Even if I can just start to like move around my feet on Planoly, look at what upcoming sponsorships need to go live. If I can, I really try to write all my captions either Friday or Sunday for the upcoming week. So I'm not jotting, you know, like stressed about writing things out. And so yeah, I try to do it on a day by day basis. And for me, tools I recommend, because people always ask like tools for organizing your feed planally. There's other great ones out there. I heard Unum or Unum, however you pronounce it. That's another option and plan. Planally has been my go-to for years. I, I use the paid version. We use Trello to stay organized for the content creatives podcast. So with our podcast, Maddie's husband, Sam edits it for us. And then Maddie and I obviously go back and forth with like podcast outlines, um, podcast graphics. And so Trello is kind of the main place where everyone goes. Um, Oh my gosh, Google Calendar for scheduling photo shoots. So I really, what ends up happening, I think on average, Maddie and I shoot probably twice a month on the weekends because she still works nine to five. And sometimes if I can, I'll try to shoot with my photographer, Holly, another photographer who I've been working with since I started Emma's Edition during the week. Shooting at least once a week, if not every other week. And then what's my other tools that I use? I'm trying to think, oh, I'm kind of old school. I use a planner like to write my to-do list. That's how I stay organized. I just, I love that. it's like, I like kind of need both just because I really like to be able to write and put things down. And then for the brain dump of planning my podcast and blog post topics, for the month, I just put in a notebook, I literally will write July, and I'll put blog post, podcast, and then I'll list, just kind of do a brain dump on like what topics I want to be talking about. So Planoly, my planner, Google Calendar and Trello, those are kind of the four big ones that I use to stay organized. That's so helpful. What would you say is some really good advice for someone who wants to start a blog? So one piece of advice I have, to, I'm going to share two. Number one is just to start testing out creating content. See if you even like it. Because like with any job, sometimes we think, oh my gosh, it would be so fun to be a chef or, you know, be an interior designer, whatever that may be. But unless you dip your toes in it, and you actually see what you like about it, you see if you enjoy the process, like taking photos and videos and editing and documenting things, just test it out. And then my second piece of advice, if you can, be aware of like what communication channels align with your strengths. So I hear people who say, I want to start a blog, but I hate writing. And I'm like, don't start a blog. There's other things. There's other things, right? Like maybe a podcast makes sense for you then. Maybe short form video content on TikTok makes sense. And so just take a step back and like think about your communication strength and think about the platforms that might work for that. Maybe your things like, oh, you just want to do like hot takes. You know, people have grown their influence and their platforms via just social commentary on Twitter. It's totally possible, totally possible to do Mm -hmm. that. And so those are kind of my two pieces of advice. Yeah, I've actually never heard someone say that first tidbit of advice. And I think that might be the best advice I've ever heard. Seriously, I'm going to start like using that and quoting you because you are spot on. People think it's the most glamorous life, so exciting, free shit all the time they can unbox, paychecks <laughs> coming in left and right. Oh my God, you got that shampoo? It's like, girl, do you know what went into this one box of shampoo and what has to now be created from this one bottle of shampoo? This is a big reason why I also talk about 
the business side of being an influencer, the business side of the influencer industry, if you are an influencer who produces content for brands, it's not just about the one Instagram photo. In airs, the aerospace industry, I was a project manager for four years. And like what I do when I work with brands and like how it's possible to secure high paying campaigns is I manage each project with each brand. There's a whole life cycle process that happens, right? From brands casting and hiring to you producing the concepts, then producing drafts, then you're getting feedback and revisions, then you do approvals, and then you post, and then you submit. And like, there's a whole, like, it's not just about the free stuff, which is great. If you like the free stuff, awesome. Like maybe it's still, you're happy and you're just like trying to test things out and you're enjoying, right? Like I especially with the free stuff, like just think of your opportunity cost, you're enjoying it. It's not a huge cost to you to like, share these things. But um, yeah, definitely. It's definitely not just about minimizing it to like the one one photos. I get asked this a lot. When you pitch a company, and you quote your rate, let's Mm -hmm. say I'm using a fake number here, let's say it's $1,000 for one Instagram in feed posts and three story frames. And then let's say the brand reaches out to you. Do you feel a certain type of way that because they reached out to you, you can charge more because clearly they want you because they pitched you? Yeah, I think as creators and influencers, we should always be pushing our rates. Like you should feel a little bit uncomfortable. You should be, how to explain that? comfortable feeling uncomfortable if that makes sense Mm -hmm. I probably will continue to I've continued to quote what I pitch versus like what a brand reaches out and full transparency you guys like 90% of my brand partnerships are brands coming to me wow people are always like how and I was like hey like the truth is if you understand your audience and you have a clear content strategy and plan and you're consistent and you know, and your community is at the forefront. And you know, like, if you're doing all those things, the brand par- partnerships are going to come if that's one way you have decided you want to make money as a content creator and influencer, right? So yeah, people are always like how and again, like, I probably could do a better job pitching, putting myself out there, you know, there's plenty of influencers who have built their careers, you know, continue to have six figure creative careers, because they're out there proactive and pitching. And then for me, I'm just like, I'm just very grateful that like the brands have continued to come to come this way. What do you think is next for you? I really want to kind of give having a creative career the best shot and experience. One day I would love to write my own book. I don't know what it would be yet, but that's on that's on the bucket list. Also just like growing and expanding the community for the content creatives podcast. I feel like the first year, I mean, I guess we also like launched during the pandemic. So right before the pandemic. So it was just like kind of a big learning year about like how to learn and produce a podcast. And now in our second year, it's like, all right, what are we going to do for our communities? Like what type of guests do we want to have on? Like what do we envision for the podcast? So continuing to grow. And then probably honestly, in five years, I will probably launch my own business. I don't know what it is yet. (laughs) I can see myself wanting to evolve in that way. But maybe I'll change my mind. Maybe I'll be a professional influencer forever. Like who knows? Um, I I do enjoy this. It's so funny because I feel like so much of the last five years in my career, the goal was to take it full time. And now I'm here. And now it's like I'm having to kind of just taste different things, experience different things, trying to like see and explore like what that next five years could look like, you know? Definitely. What's your favorite kind of partnership? Do you really enjoy travel? Do you really enjoy product-based, service-based, when it's across multiple platforms? Giving you all the options. That's like such a great question. I think my favorite partnerships are when we have multiple platforms involved. Because I always, especially like I have not worked on the brand side, but if I were on the brand side, And I had an influencer partner, let's make multiple touch points. Let's, you know, because I don't think people realize your blog audience is not the same as your Instagram audience, Mm -hmm. five to 10%, maybe 20% might be, but those are different audiences. So let's do a long form piece of content. And then let's do Instagram and let's supplement it with like whitelisting or paid ad continue to like boost that piece of content. So it's seen in a broader, you know, audience. And then let's also create TikTok content 
let's tweet about it. There's all these platforms on, I'm on and I'm just like, let's make the most out of this partnership and like, let's use all these platforms. It's obviously more work, right? For both sides to be producing content, <laughs> um, content like that. But I have found more out of the partnership when you involve multiple just platforms and, and things like that. But honestly, this is like kind of on the flip end. I like brand partnerships that work with my like lifestyle, if that makes sense. And so Me I've too. like, celeb- I just like have celebrated like such big things over the last few years, getting married, you know, like having partnerships that make sense for that. Like, of course, I want glass prints of re-engagement photos. Of course, I'm going to take photos in like my wedding dress. And part of it is like, I probably could be better about like, hey, I'm going through this life stage, I should pitch my brand partners. But um, when brands are able to like see and like are like oh my gosh this would make a natural fit let's talk about it that's when I'm like most excited about brand partnerships because like perfect like this works perfectly for my life right now when a brand pitches you and you come to terms sign the contract create whatever the campaign is is there ever a time that you reach back out and say hey it's been x amount of time but I was thinking of this idea or that's not really in your wheelhouse my biggest tip in securing and developing relationships with your brand partners and PR contacts, when you're wrapping up that partnership, you should be pitching for the next one. I literally say, hey, so-and-so really enjoyed our time together. I hope the brand enjoyed this partnership. I enjoyed creating content for the brand. If there are future influencer activations you need support with, please keep me in mind. I would love to work with the brand again in the fall or winter season. You have my most updated media kit and my contact information. That's my biggest, like, yes, you need to every partnership that you're enjoying. I that, that that doesn't always happen, right? Where I have a great experience, but like, you need to be pitching for the next cycle. And so when people ask like, oh my gosh, like how are you continuing to track brand partnerships? I tell my brand partners I'm available and I'm, I tell them I'm ready for the next partnership. And I know this like sounds crazy. One PR company in one year, oh my God, let me do the math real quick. Cause it was just, I think it was three partnerships. One PR company in one year brought me $31,000 in partnerships. Oof. One PR company. But that's because I've developed the relationship. Every time I work with this PR company, I say, I had a great time working with your team. I always enjoy working with you guys, like many other creators out there. You work really hard at those partnerships. Let them know you want to continue to work together. I think that's like a really easy miss and a really easy change any creator and influencer can do. Yeah, nothing wrong with over communicating. Yeah. A follower recently asked me how to be on the list of other PR firms that are not local. She sent a really long message, pretty much saying, like, I had no idea that you could be working with a PR firm based in New York for a product or service. I thought it was like, if you're in Philly, which both of us are, the follower and me, it's Philly-based PR firms only. So one thing to remember is that these local PR firms are probably owned by higher parent companies, right? And that's what I've noticed. I've worked with three different PR firms, but they're under the same parent company. And so if you're interested in getting on any PR list for products, it can be as easy as this. Go to the brand's Instagram, hit message, say, hi, brand. I'm a Seattle-based influencer, or my name's Emma. I'm a Seattle-based influencer. We'd love to know if there's opportunities to get on the PR list. I create skincare and beauty types of contents and will have the opportunity to potentially showcase the brand. Is there a designated PR specific email that I could reach out to? Thank you. That's it. Like all you have to do, like spot on, <laughs> spot on, test it, pick your favorite, go to Kiehl's, like click on Kiehl's hit message. I just say Kiehl's because like the last thing I put on my face, write that out, say who you are, where you're from, inquire about if there's a designated email address where you can get on the PR list and then you'll hear from them. And a big thing, I don't think creators realize this. Not every influencer agency or PR agency is this organized or has these systems in place, but the big ones have influencer databases. They literally, once they work with an influencer, they put you in your name, your niche, Maybe they upload your media kit. I don't know. I actually haven't seen it. I've only heard from my PR contacts that like they have databases for this. And so once you're in that database, you'll see other opportunities kind of pop up. 
do you recommend spreading your options for revenue? So not just partnerships, also affiliate links and courses, maybe eBooks, all of that. Yeah. So how I mentioned picking communication channels, no matter who you are as a creator or an influencer, take the step back and think about how you want to make money and what your strengths are. If you naturally are coaching people online and sharing wellness tips and sharing, you know, ways to improve your morning routine or make sure you eat breakfast every day, maybe a revenue stream could be coaching. Think about that. But if you are a creator and you've found that just like linking your outfits and like linking the chairs that you recently bought and decorating your rug, you find that like, oh no, your followers literally look to you for product recommendations and they like want to see what you're wearing and like how you're decorating your home, then affiliate links make sense for you. And like, that's how you should build your business. It's all about like just taking that step back just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. You have to think about what does my audience know and expect from me? What do I know about myself and my brand that I know and expect from me? Do I even have five true fans or a hundred true fans who would purchase a product or a service if I launched it? I actually gave an example of this in the content creatives podcast. And I know people really don't like her and people really do like her. Kylie Jenner (laughs) became known for her lips. Everyone was like, it's lip filler. It's this. Everyone kept talking about her lips. And what did she do? Launched a lip kit. She became known from something, her audience expected something from her, and she created a product that met that. So with you, I mean, we're not Kylie Jenner, obviously, right? Like, think about what people are going to us for. I naturally have a coaching, teaching, big sister style, where I share tips. And, you know, I, that's because I'm a big sister, like, I naturally do that. Like, I've been big sistering my little sister for my whole life. And so... um that tone probably comes across and the business tone probably comes across, right? So for me, I knew courses were going to make sense. I know coaching is going to make sense. I dabbled in it very briefly, but want to do like a full mentorship program one day. So I was like, okay, I know it's going to work. So like, let me focus on getting married this year. And I, and I get, and I did. And so I was like, okay, now we can start to think about that. Think about yourself as a creator. Think about how you want to make money because there's so many ways to make money online ebooks, courses, speaking, right? Like if you're a podcaster, you literally could get hired by companies and conferences and events to come speak at like live panels. Like that's like a a way you can make money. Affiliate partnerships, brand partnerships. There are creators out there who are just hired by brands to produce content and not even post and feed. There's plenty of creators to do that. There's so many ways to do it. So while you can, if you are in that place to do so think about like what makes sense for me on how I want to make money I made that conscious decision in 2017 I said I want to make money through brand partnerships this is how I want to do it and so for me like 90% of my income comes from brand partnerships and I know like people are like oh my gosh isn't that scary but at the same time I'm like you guys like it's just been so successful I am gonna keep doing this so (laughs) yeah I change anything when it's working yeah I'm just like I have it found that need yet to like shift how I make money and like managing brand partnerships makes sense for me. I just, I get the timelines. I get the cycle. I understand why, you know, PR companies and in-house marketing tips, I understand what they need. And because I've been on the other side, diff- completely different projects, right? Not influencer partnerships, but it just works for my former experiences and I think my strengths. How many days do you wait to follow up on an email if you don't have a response? I usually will probably just wait five business days. I just have heard that like some people reserve emails for like specific days of the week. And so if I haven't heard in like a full five business days, then I'll follow up. Like even if I'm just like waiting for like revisions, I'm like, hi, just like want to make sure like I didn't miss anything. Totally. I ask everyone who comes on, is there a product that you recently have been using that you just love and fully recommend? Yes. I started using Tatcha, T-A-T-C-H-A. The purple. Um, I started the purple one. Um, It's been amazing for my skin. It's been like- Is this a cleanser or a serum? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I've been using the 
it's not the serum. It's literally the cream. Like I use it at night. And one thing I was always very confused about when I was getting, it's been a long time since I've gotten a facial. The three facials I went to, they were like, you have dry skin. And I was like, but I drink water. And they're like, that's not, it's not just about drinking water. And so this was something that was, that's been recommended, like with the facials I've gone to, my girlfriends use this and it's called Tatcha, the dewy skin cream, plumping and hydrating moisturizer. So for me, like my dry skin is like my big thing that I like want to make sure my skin's moisturized and it's so good. It's a little bit expensive. It's like $68 for a bottle, but it's been worth it. As I've That's gotten, what matters. Yeah. I'm like, you know what? It's my face. I'm just going to do it. So, <laughs> it's what people see. Right? <laughs> it's my face. <laughs> <laughs> For people who loved this episode and just want more of you, can you share with everyone how people can find you on all the social platforms? Yes, you guys can find me at Emma's Edition on Instagram. Uh, my blog is emmasedition.com. And if you like the influencer content creation ch- tips, negotiation tips, just like everything about being an influencer and content creator, highly recommend you check us out at the Content Creatives Podcast. There's so many episodes about just like real life experiences and lessons that we've learned as influencers and creators. And then other than that, you can also find me on TikTok at Emma's Edition, Twitter, Emblem Cortez, my full name. I'm kind of active. I feel like I'm more of like a watcher on Twitter, but I'm, I'm there. And then um, Facebook, Emma's Edition. And then we also have a podcast Facebook group where we give feedback, you know, we share some tips, like additional conversations are in there. And you can find us at the Content Creatives Podcast on Facebook. That's pretty much it. Thanks so much for having me on today. Yes. Thank you so much for joining. This was amazing. I feel like this was so helpful. There's constantly questions in my DMs about how to start, what to expect, how much do I charge? So thank you for hitting all the hot topics. Yes, you're welcome. Yay. Okay, we did it. (laughs) We did it. (laughs) If you enjoyed this podcast, feel free to share with your friends, family, loved ones, really anyone who you think would gain value from this episode. And if you're feeling up for it, please subscribe, rate, and review. It means so, so much. 